Greetings everyone, Professor Fiore here. Now we are going to talk about Miller frequency tailoring. This is a very common trick that is used to control the high frequency response of linear transistor amplifiers. So let's start with a basic single stage BJT amplifier. I've got a split supply here, swapping resistor. Let's do a real quick calculation. We know we're going to get most of this 10 volts, less the 0.7 on the base emitter and a little bit on RB. Let's call it maybe around 9 volts, smidge over, dropping on these two biasing resistors, the swapping resistor and the uh, emitter bias resistor of 820. So we're going to get somewhere in the vicinity of 10 mils, right? I mean, this adds up to a little over 900 ohms, and we've got uh, a little over 9 volts, so somewhere around 10 mils which in turn will give us an R prime E, 26 millivolts divided by that current, will get us two and a half ohms, right? Somewhere in that vicinity, right? Plus or minus some tenths. Now we look at the collector resistance, the AC collector resistance. We've got a 1K in parallel with a 20K, which will give us a smidge over 950 ohms. If we divide those two things out, right? A little over 950 and, uh, you know, like I said, 90. 394, whatever it is, we get a gain that's just about 10 in magnitude, right? Maybe a, a little tiny bit more than 10 in magnitude. So I throw my signal in here. We expect a signal that's inverted at the output 10 times the size. Now, I'm not going to go through all of the calculations on the upper frequency limit. There are videos on that. So if you really want to get into it, check those out. The F2, the high frequency or lag response, of this amplifier, right? We've got a video on that, and of course it's covered in some detail in the free textbook. But let's just do a quick sim and see what we get, all right? So I'm gonna come up here, AC analysis, do an AC transfer characteristic. Um, I'm gonna start at one hertz, go up to 10 megahertz. Let's see what we get. I'm only interested in this case in the amplitude, not the phase. So here's my plot. I'm gonna grab a little cursor out here move this around. So we can see we're getting a gain of 19.2 uh, dB, so just a little bit less than 20 dB, just a little bit less than 10, which would make sense because we are getting a little bit of loss on this generator, right, this R gen of 500 ohms, which is representing the output impedance of the preceding stage. Um, we're getting a little loss between that and the input impedance, and then of course we have this gain of a little over 10, so we're getting just about 10, smidge less than 10, for the whole thing, all right? Okay, what's the upper upper uh, break frequency on here, right? 19.2, I would wanna go up to minus three dB or 16.2, which actually is just off the limit on here, right? I'm at 16.9 and that's at 10 megahertz. So this thing is going up pretty good, right? Lower frequency limit we can see is down here somewhere around maybe 10 hertz or so. So, you know, a nice broadband kind of amplifier, right? There's a 16.2 is like 9.76 dB. Um, uh, per, sorry, <laughs> 9.76 hertz. So you could use this as an audio amplifier, although it really has a top end that goes way, way beyond what you need. You know, for an audio amplifier, we only really need to go up to, you know, about 20 kilohertz up around here somewhere. Okay, um, you know, if you're just doing like maybe a telephony thing, like a voice thing, it doesn't even need to go that high. You know, if you can get uh, five kilohertz, you know, that would probably be fine for something like that. But, you know, for a general purpose audio, yeah, we want to go to 20 kilohertz. Now, what's the problem with going out way out here, 10 megahertz plus? Well, there's a possibility that we could be getting radio frequency interference, right? Signals coming in here that ultimately modulate the signal, they get rectified, we get uh, you know, distortion components coming into the output. I don't like that, right? Most people don't like that. We would probably want to filter the input to a more reasonable upper break frequency. There's no reason to go out to 10 megahertz. No reason at all. Matter of fact, if you can bring the critical frequency down to maybe 35 or 40 kilohertz, your variation at 20 kilohertz will only be about a dB, right? So you can get rid of a lot of potential interference up here 
and still have a pretty nice flat response. You know, 1 dB down at 20 kilohertz, that's pretty darn good, all right? So let's think in terms of, yeah, I want to, you know, get a, an upper break of maybe, you know, 35, 40 kilohertz, somewhere around there. What do I do? Well, sort of the classical approach to this would be to focus in on the input or maybe the output lag network. Usually the input lag network is a little bit more effective. Our gen actually plays a, a major role in setting the resistance. What we want to do is throw a, a capacitor out here in parallel with RB. This creates a lag network. We would thevenize around that. We would find the impedance looking out this way and the impedance looking this way, right? The, the Z end of the op amp, excuse me, the Z end of the transistor. And in this case, the R gen is going to dominate, right? When we look into this, we're probably going to get a, a Z in of maybe like 10K or so, right? You got a, a 91 out here plus the R prime E. You got a beta, maybe 150 or so, maybe 200, something like that. So, you know, you're going to get 15, 20 K ohms for a Z in base. With the RB, yeah, you know, you're, you're going to be looking at a pretty big value. Like I said, maybe 10K. And... Um, off this side, we've got the 500. So this is clearly going to dominate because those wind up being in parallel. Now I'll just use my standard uh, critical frequency equation, right? 1 over 2 pi um, RC gives me the frequency. In this case, I want to set that frequency to, like I said, 35, 40 kilohertz. And we'll just figure out what the capacitance has to be to get critical at that point. And what that will do is that lag network will roll off at 6 dB per octave or 20 dB per, dec per decade. So as the signal, input signal, in this case a noise signal, an interference signal goes up in frequency, it starts to drop down in amplitude. We don't have as much problem. All right, so like I said, that would be sort of like the classical way of, of doing it. Uh, you could do the same thing on the output. You could do it on both for, a ma uh, for, for that matter, right? Um, when you do the calculation, you actually wind up with a, a decently large size capacitor, you know, not like your bypass cap, but still a pretty big capacitor. So here is that circuit, right? I've already done the calculation, and it turns out we need about a 9.1 nanofarad capacitor, near a standard value, right? 9.1 nanofarads. So as I said, this is largely going to interact with um, the 500, because the Z in over here is um, so much larger. And we can just do an analysis on this to determine what our new frequency response looks like. Now, because I know this is going to roll off sooner, I've brought this down to 1 meg instead of 10 meg for the upper limit. And you can see exactly what's happening, right? So this is rolling off much faster. We're still getting our gain of uh, about 19.2. The base end hasn't changed at all. But now when we push up, right, 19.2, 3 dB down would be 16.2. And that is going to be right around there, right? So that's 36.67, something like that, um, kilohertz. So like I said, down around 20 kilohertz, we're only going to be looking around, you know, 1 dB uh, off, okay, from our uh, middle, middle band gain there, okay? So right about there. Yeah, so there's 18.1, 19.66 kilohertz. Okay, so, you know, great. Hey, what about Miller? What's the deal with Miller? Well, if you remember Miller's theorem, and if you don't know at all what I'm talking about, there's a video and discussion in the textbook um, on Miller's theorem. Basically what Miller's theorem says is if you have an inverting amplifier, which is what we have here, right, a flip in the output phase, and there's an impedance straddling this, in other words, going from the input terminal to the output terminal, that impedance, which I'll call the Miller impedance, can be simplified by creating two equivalents, an input Miller, which would be in parallel, and an output Miller, which would be in parallel. And the computation for that is a function of the gain of the amplifier, the magnitude of the gain. And basically the way it works out is the input Miller impedance is that Miller impedance divided by the gain plus one. And on the output end, it's the Miller impedance times the gain divided by the gain plus one. In other words, for large gains, basically whatever the Miller impedance is out here, okay? Um, and then it gets reduced essentially by the size of the, uh, the gain out here. Now in the case of a capacitor, 
capacitive reactants and capacitance are inversely proportional. So what you're really saying is, as far as a cap, if I were to put a cap in the Miller position, right, that creates two capacitors, one on the input, one on the output. The one on the output is going to be pretty close to the value of Miller capacitance, but the one on the input winds up being gain plus one times bigger. Gain plus one times bigger. So that means I can use a much smaller cap, right? In other words, that cap is going to be physically smaller, and most likely it's going to be less expensive. All right, so why not do that? And by the way, when you use Miller's theorem, unlike this, you're going to get two lag networks. You're going to get one on the input and one on the output. So it's like you get the second lag network free, right? Buy one lag network, get the second lag network free. All we have to do is put a cap across here, and the approximate value of that will be whatever we calculated divided by gain plus one, right? So I'm going to take my 9.1 nanofarads. I know my gain from base to collector is approximately 10, a smidge over 10. So I'm going to basically divide this by 11, which is going to get me around 8 nanofarads. Now, the result is going to look like this, okay? So, oh, I said 8 nanofarads. I meant 8, 800 picofarads, 0.8 nanofarads. So I threw in standard value 750 um, because there's actually some base to uh, collector capacitance in, all, in here already, which we could kind of lump into here. And I also know that I'm going to get a little bit of, of effect on the output as well. So I'm going to use, in this case, something slightly smaller rather than slightly larger. But that is my nearest standard value on the small side. So... I'm going to take 750 picofarads instead of 9.1 nanofarads. Now, let's check out what we get for the response. All right, does this really work? Well, of course it's got to work. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing a video on it. All right, so... <laughs> how's that for a cynical reason? So there's our gain, 19.2. The bottom end is still, you know, what we saw before. And now the top end, we were looking for you know, like I said, 35, 40 kilohertz or so. Um, and that had to be 16.2, so there we are. Okay, so this one's like 35 kilohertz. When we did it the sort of brute force way, all right, with the, um, with the original uh, nine that we had, 9.1 nanofarads, all right, we got 36.6, uh, okay, so that's actually a little bit more aggressive, right? Basically around the same though. You know, we're kind of splitting hairs here. But like I said, the really nice thing here is, hey, I get to use the small capacitor instead of that much larger capacitor out here. All right, that's pretty cool. Like I said, we get the bonus of um, lowering the critical frequency of the output network as well. So yeah, why not do this? Right, I mean, this has become the sort of standard when it becomes uh, an issue of having to tailor, tailor the high frequency response. So, for example, if you look at um, an operational amplifier, if you look at the internal circuitry of it, usually on the stage that's driving the class B, the final class B output section, um, you will see you know, a small signal transistor like this driving the class B power section, and there'll be a capacitor right in this position, this Miller capacitor. And that's what it's doing. It's controlling this high frequency response. It's getting us what we need with a much more modest value. And remember, the higher the gain, the greater the effect, right? I'm using a fairly small gain here, only 10. But if you had a high gain amplifier, you know, gain of 100, then the capacitor that you use over here is like 100 times smaller. So in our case, you know, we'd be using like, you know, 75 picofarads instead of 9 nanofarads. Okay, so yeah, that makes really good sense, especially in an integrated circuit. You know, you don't want to take up a lot of uh, uh, real estate, so to speak, for a big capacitor. So that works much, much better. All right, and it's all based on this Miller's theorem of um, sort of multiplying the capacitor in this inverting amplifier. Okay, so 
like I said, there is uh, more detail on that in the in the video specifically addressing Miller's theorem. So, you know, you might want to take a look at that, get a little refresher. You want a little bit more detail, examples. Um, take a look at that. Take a look at the material in the book. But here we are, a very effective way to control the high frequency performance of your amplifier with a modest component. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed this one. We'll see you next time. Take care.